Ms. Broughton will present her final report to Minister Whalen, and Ms. Broughton will then deliver her remarks, followed by a response from Minister Whalen. Good morning, everyone. For the past nine months, it's been my privilege to meet and work with many dedicated Nova Scotians who share a deep commitment to our province and its future. In every corner of this province, I heard a sense of urgency that change is desperately needed to secure a better future for our children, our grandchildren, and the generations that will follow. The Tax and Regulatory Review has concluded, and I'm pleased to be here this morning to share some of its highlights and answer your questions. The review confirms that the trajectory Nova Scotia is on is unsustainable, and to continue on the current path will bring negative results financially, economically, and socially for years to come. But if Nova Scotians are willing to accept change, to change direction, Nova Scotia's prospects can and will dramatically improve. The changes advocated in the report may seem too difficult, too impossible to contemplate, but they are not. They are proportional to the challenges we face. Fifteen years ago, Alan Shaw, then Chair of Voluntary Planning, publicly wondered if Nova Scotia could be saved from itself. After nine months of consultation, investigation and study, I believe the answer is yes. We can do it if we want to. Eight months ago, the Ivany Commission warned that we are on the verge of a very significant and prolonged decline in our standard of living and the quality of public services we depend on. Again, as the Commission made clear, dire predictions can be averted if the province takes bold and decisive action on behalf of the people of Nova Scotia and for the benefit of Nova Scotians tomorrow. When it comes to change, if Nova Scotians accept the why, as I believe we do, and have the will, which I hope we'd have, the report charts a path towards how. Some measures recommended in the report will no doubt be opposed and criticized. The recommendation's potential for popularity did not influence the outcome of this review. I was asked how reforming Nova Scotia's taxes, regulations, and fees could help Nova Scotia meet its fiscal, economic, and demographic challenges, and that's what I have tried to do. It is my hope that Nova Scotians and the government will see the proposals as a comprehensive package, and when taken together, present a fair, balanced, and pragmatic way forward. The report asks the government, and in turn Nova Scotians, to avoid the temptation of cherry-picking among the proposed tax reforms, and ignoring or rejecting the less palatable. The numbers simply won't add up and Nova Scotia will not get to where it needs to be. The recommendations focus on the central feature of the terms of reference, the economic growth imperative in Nova Scotia. At its essence, this report is founded on a few inescapable facts. The province is aging, the economy is struggling, public services cost more than we pay. A path forward must meet those challenges head on. The review drew on a wide array of studies and findings from local, national, international academics, reform efforts undertaken by governments across the country and around the globe, as well as many other sor sources, in a search for ideas and actions that could be relevant to Nova Scotia. During the course of the consultation, experts, business leaders, and Nova Scotians right across the province made it abundantly clear that fundamental tax changes are required to create a more competitive and ultimately more prosperous economic climate in Nova Scotia. Today, at virtually every income level and for almost every family configuration, Nova Scotians pay either the highest or second highest personal income taxes in Canada. That is both a disincentive to work and a deterrent to keeping young Nova Scotians here or encouraging new Nova Scotians to come to our province. The long-term result will be an overall reduction in the size of the workforce, 
along with the income taxes they pay. Either Nova Scotians can decide to make changes to turn around or we will tumble without sufficient revenue to pay for the public services we all want to support our quality of life. The province simply cannot expect fewer workers to produce the income revenue it will need. And as the baby boom retires and ages, the province's biggest bill, health care, will get even bigger. Nova Scotia cannot allow a massive generational shift in the tax burden. From the largest generation in history to significantly fewer younger Nova Scotians. Young Nova Scotians are already leaving for better economic prospects. And without a significant change in tax structure, the heavy end of the tax burden will fall on those who remain. Not only would it be inequitable, it will be too much for them to bear. Equally as problematic, high personal income taxes douse the sparks that can fire dynamic economies. In Nova Scotia, we need those sparks to ignite in every corner of the province. We need entrepreneurs, risk takers, doers and dreamers to call Nova Scotia home, to build businesses, to create products and services and sell them around the world, to employ their fellow Nova Scotians, to achieve success and ultimately make our economy strong and vibrant. If Nova Scotia wants to drive economic growth, personal income tax reductions must be made a priority. In a similar vein, the highest corporate income taxes in Canada puts Nova Scotia at a distinct competitive disadvantage. And the large gap between the corporate tax rate at 16% and the small business rate at 3%, as well as the low threshold, are disincentives to growth. Nova Scotia desperately needs economic growth and a more competitive business climate. The answers may be challenging, but they are self-evident. Lower corporate taxes to a level competitive with much of Canada. Increase the small business threshold and gradually increase small business taxes to narrow the gap with a reduced general corporate tax rate and encourages all businesses to grow, create jobs and drive prosperity. But how do we do this when the province is not in a fiscal position to decrease corporate or personal income taxes without recovering lost revenues from other sources? There is little chance that the federal government will solve the province's financial problems. In fact, every indication from Ottawa suggests quite the opposite. So tax reductions will have to be replaced from other provincial tax sources by shifting the tax base and holding the line on spending. Nova Scotia must heed the advice from leading economists that shifting the burden away from income-based taxation to consumption-based taxation can have significant benefits to economic growth and job creation. This shift in tax emphasis will also provide improved incentives for work and investment. Perhaps as important for Nova Scotia, there is an incredibly strong demographic driver for reform. But Nova Scotia's harmonized sales tax, the HST, at 15% is the highest in Canada. There is no room for an increase. The base, however, can and should be expanded by removing point of sale rebates and cancelling the energy rebate program, YERP. The shift of tax emphasis away from income toward consumption will balance the burden more equitably across generations as well as across means and ability to pay. But let me be very clear, the increase in consumption taxes will be revenue neutral to the province and consumption tax increases will be more than offset by income tax reductions as well as measures to mitigate negative impacts on low income Nova Scotians. A further taxation shift away from personal and corporate income, things that are good for the province, requires Nova Scotia to consider imposing taxes on things it doesn't like such as pollution and greenhouse gas emissions, and to use that revenue to further reduce taxes. The basic rationale for pollution taxation is clear. Pollution imposes costs on society that are not currently borne by the polluter. A tax ensures that the polluter accounts for these costs. A Nova Scotia pollution tax to be phased in over the next 10 years can play a key role in shifting the tax balance. Pollution or carbon taxes are supported by as many economists as environmentalists. 
noteworthy organizations such as the IMF, the OECD, Canada's Ecofiscal Commission, and many other maintain that most nations, Canada being one, rely too much on income taxes and too little on fossil fuel energy taxes. Pollution taxes are not about raising new revenues. Instead, as in the case of the consumption tax shift, the focus of reform must be on restructuring the tax system away from taxes that are harmful to efficient economic growth like high income taxes and toward carefully designed taxes on polluting fossil fuel emissions, smarter taxation, not a higher tax burden. Nova Scotia can follow the trailblaze by British Columbia over the past eight years. Since instituting a carbon tax in 2006, British Columbia has reduced corporate taxes to among the lowest in the OECD, lowered income taxes for middle and low earners, and recorded economic growth above the national average. Like BC, Nova Scotia's pollution tax should be, by law, revenue neutral. All revenues generated will be returned to Nova Scotian taxpayers through personal and corporate income tax reductions. Tax relief and rebates to offset or mitigate the impact on low-income Nova Scotians must also be part of the program. As stated earlier, by setting the stage and implementing foundational taxation shifts toward consumption and pollution, which are revenue neutral, real changes, changes that will put more money into Nova Scotians' pockets, can then be delivered. The proposed Nova Scotia tax reduction plan is premised on the assumption that the government can and will hold the line on spending. In fact, the first recommendation in the report is that Nova Scotia should freeze program spending at current levels, adjusted only for existing collective agreement commitments. Without flatlining overall program spending, the government has no realistic chance to make meaningful tax reductions. By holding the line on spending, the province would post a relatively small deficit next year and surpluses in the years to follow. Those surpluses would be used to maintain momentum in tax relief, both corporate and personal, to fund priority transformational investments, and to provide relief to low-income Nova Scotians and ultimately begin paying down debt. A final element of the tax recommendations which I want to highlight is the recommendation that the province should take a more nuanced approach to corporate tax incentives. The tax system is a blunt instrument for economic development. Corporate tax expenditures are designed to provide an incentive or subsidy to specific industries. Specific tax incentives distort the balance, equity and neutrality that are characteristics of an ideal tax system. But virtually every jurisdiction uses them and Nova Scotia has its share. The report recommends increased vigilance and accountability to ensure tax incentives offer good public value and meet the policy objectives for which they were intended. All business tax credits should be targeted in scope and limited in duration, and only those that demonstrate success should be extended. A number of targeted recommendations are made to reform specific tax credits. Although there is a lot more to say about taxes, almost half the report is dedicated to regulations and fees, and I want to spend a few minutes giving the highlights of the proposed regulatory reforms. When it comes to fees, the province needs to get a handle on the true cost of the services it provides. Until it does, fees should be frozen at current levels. However, once a uniform, reliable costing mechanism is in place, Non-essential services should be offered on a full cost recovery basis with exceptions where full cost recovery places an inordinate burden on the user. Robust analysis and costing of programs will no doubt also reveal inefficiencies that can be corrected to reduce the cost and attached fees for some services. Regulation. Red tape costs Nova Scotia an estimated at, of $747 million annually. In recognition of this reality, the report sets out a large number of measures to reform the regulatory processes of government, to make government work better. To help Nova Scotia use regulatory change as a springboard to the transformation of government, transformation that is required to maintain and improve public services while making them sustainable in the long term. It's not easy to change government. It will require committed leadership 
from the very top to the front line and in every corner of the province. A public commitment is needed to ensure reform is a government-wide priority. Mechanisms, including legislation, are called for to keep the reform and modernization agenda alive over the long term, to create a culture of continuous regulatory assessment, reduction and reform, and to put in place a proven structure to drive change, a minister responsible, a central office, a single point of accountability with the authority to coordinate regulatory reform across government. Citizens, businesses and public servants at every level should be directly engaged in the process and joint teams of government and economic sector leaders must be established to identify priority regulatory issues which, if resolved, would strengthen the sector's economic success. These teams working expeditiously would create an inventory of regulations to be eliminated or simplified. These efforts would culminate in legislation to repeal all outdated or inefficient regulations, streamline others for more effective enforcement and ease of compliance, and reduce regulatory overlap and redundancies. The target for this legislation, a multi-department departmental omnibus bill should be the spring of 2015, a regulatory spring cleaning. As well, regional and intergovernmental regulatory harmonization should be a priority. Areas deserving of specific mention for immediate review should include the scope and responsibility delegated to the UARB, whose mandate is broader than most other provincial review boards. As well, based on what was heard in the consultations, there should be a particular focus on small owner operated business the, and the compliance burdens they face. Finally, based on the advice received during consultations, other key areas for red tape reduction include liquor license laws and vehicle and transportation regulations. Nova Scotians know we need change. We know the very future of Nova Scotia depends on what we do today. The path ahead requires commitment, discipline, and bold action to drive the province toward a fundamental shift in taxation with lower income taxes and corporate taxes compensated by taxing pollution and consumption and holding the line on spending. As well as taking direct aim at the inefficient regulatory burden imposed on the economy and making sure that fees better reflect the cost of services. The hard truth is that Nova Scotia's economy is underperforming. Young Nova Scotians are leaving and the future does not look promising. But the good news is, we can change that. We have a path if we are willing to take it. Having spent a decade in government, I can tell you that action of the magnitude proposed by this review will only take place if there is vocal support and visible efforts from a great many Nova Scotians. Political will comes with the collective will of the people. For the benefit of our Nova Scotia, Scotia future, it is my sincere hope that the dreams and aspirations that we all have for our children and our grandchildren's tomorrows will guide and strengthen our collective resolve to take action today. Thank you very much. I look forward to your questions. Well, today I'm very pleased to be receiving the much anticipated Nova Scotia Tax and Regulatory Review. I would first like to thank Laurel Broughton for her hard work. Our tax system had not been reviewed in any comprehensive way, in the, at least in the collective memory of our department. For decades, the tax system has been added to and subtracted from in a piecemeal fashion by successive governments. That really makes no sense, and it's why we asked Laurel to undertake this review. Laurel had a huge task ahead of her and just a short period of time to do it. I met with Laurel this morning and had a chance to briefly flip through the report after that. We had made a commitment to Nova Scotians to take a close look at taxes, fees and regulations based on certain principles, fairness, sustainability, simplicity and competitiveness. I believe that Laurel has put together a report that does just that and I thank her for it. Also, she's she was assisted in her work by a team uh, from the Department of Finance and Treasury Board. Their work on the review was very valuable and I want to offer my deep appreciation for their dedication and efforts. 
Second, I want to thank the citizens and businesses and many organizations that met with Laurel and, and or submitted their thoughts on the tax and regulatory system that we have in Nova Scotia. Our tax fee and regulatory system is a big part of what creates a fair and competitive environment for business. Equally important, at times more so, are regulations. The input received was critical and I want to thank everybody who contributed. I will now be taking more time to carefully review these recommendations further with Nova Scotians and with businesses and organizations as well. There are some good ideas in here and many of them are very challenging ideas. Laurel's findings are very consistent with the one Nova Scotia Commission. We do need to be bold. So I'm really looking forward to hearing from Nova Scotians and discussing the report in more detail with them. The decisions that will come out of those discussions will make their way into the budget beginning in 2015-16. I would love to be in a position to offer tax cuts to businesses and to Nova Scotians. But given the financial position that we are in, we can't just lower taxes without some kind of a trade-off, without finding cuts somewhere else. We need to take measures to get our fiscal house in order, which will put Nova Scotia on a sound fiscal footing for future success. We need to find a sustainable level of government spending. And why is that? Because we need to do what's right for young people. We need to give them a secure economic future so that they can choose to stay in Nova Scotia and raise their families here. So we can encourage those who have left to come back home. And so we can make a home for others who choose to choose Nova Scotia as a good place to live and raise their families. As a next step, I want to, I intend to talk to Nova Scotians about this report and about how together we can strengthen Nova Scotia's future. The first session will be held later in December here in Halifax. I also would encourage Nova Scotians to go to the finance website and, and submit your thoughts and, and ideas in response to this report. Once I've had the opportunity to study this report and discuss it widely with Nova Scotians and with my colleagues, I will outline the first steps in what will be a long-term tax reform plan in Budget 2015-16. Thank you.